Thank you, praise team. We have definitely, we definitely have a lot of talent in this church. There is no doubt about that. I want to share with you guys something. And no, I'm not going to be dividing this up between everybody. I don't know. <laughs> so old American. Uh, what I have in my hand is a real, not quite crisp, $100 bill. You say, well, why are you showing that to us? Why didn't that go in the offering? <laughs> Well, I'm going to answer that question. This past week, uh, First Lady Jenny and I had the privilege of going down to Hilton Head to a minister's and spouse's uh, retreat, a much-needed retreat for that matter. We had a glorious time. I had every intention of doing work while I was there, and uh, the Lord had other plans, and we ended up just resting those, those days, didn't we? We just had, it was wonderful. Uh, just to be able to rest those few days and to be ministered to. Well, the first day or first evening we were there, it's it's normally the missions banquet. I enjoy the missions banquet. It's a a delicious meal. They serve a delicious meal there. It's not a huge meal. It's delicious, though. It's fun to be around the different missionaries and uh, pastors. And there's always a guest speaker there. But before they got to the guest speaker, Pastor Frank, and I'm going to not even try and pronounce his last name from CLA over in Columbia, got up and he said, I need five pastors to come up right now. Lead pastors, I need you to come up right now. Well, nobody was moving because I've been in those situations before. I have done those situations before. I need five youth to come up right now, you know, and the kids are like, yeah, yeah, and they get up there. All right, now you're going to eat this bubble gum out of this bowl filled with whipped cream and chocolate. Okay, I, I was just like, I've got zero desire. And he's like, no, really, you'll be blessed if you come up here. And so reluctantly, I, was, I think I was the first one up. And as soon as I got up, four other guys followed. We went up to the front, and he said, no, nah, I told you, you'll be blessed. And he pulled out of his pocket $500, five of these right here. He said, now, I'm going to give each one of you $100 just for coming up here. And I'm sitting there thinking, sweet, what's the catch? <laughs> And he did. He gave us all $100 bills. And he said, now, you have a choice. You can keep that $100 bills. It's yours. You can have that $100, enjoy it, spend it. Or you can give it to BGMC. Now, BGMC is something we participate here with our boys and girls, uh, uh, Missionary uh, for Christ, or Missions for Christ. And so Children's Church right now is meeting. And one of the things that they participate on a regular basis is BGMC. Parents, I know you're all too well familiar with BGMC. So he said, or your third option is to take this $100 bill and invest it and come back with a return next year. And I thought, hmm, game on. I love a challenge. So what we're going to do with this $100 bill is we'll end up putting together a committee or a team of some sort to brainstorm ideas on the way that we can best invest these $100, or this $100, so that we can get a return. And he looked at me as we were leaving. I said, you know, it was like, we're going to do BG, we're going to invest this. He said, I want, he said, I want, a, you know, at least 100 back, you know, more. I thought, that's too easy. We could take up an offering right now and get 100 bucks back. That's no problem at all. We could even probably get five or $600 back for BGMC. That wouldn't be, that, that's not a challenge. You know what a challenge to me would be? A challenge to me would be to look at the scripture and see the good stewards, the ones that took their, their money. And the first one, he, he brought back five times what he had, was given. Okay? The second one brought back ten times what he was given. Now, ten times would be $1,000. And I thought, that's still, I mean, $1,000 is not bad for me. There's kids that can raise $1,000. Then the other scriptures started to pop into mind. Those servants that went out, and they produced a crop of 30, 60, and 100 fold. And I thought, now that's a challenge. So that's what I would love to do, is for you guys to believe with me and to pray with me for wisdom, for creativity, how we can invest this $100 bills. And I'm going to show you guys, you, you're, you've seen this $100 bills. This is what we're going to, th- this one, we're going to invest it this year somehow in different ways to multiply it and see it grow. We'll water it, cultivate it, multiply it, see it grow. And at the end of the year, I would love to see at least a 30-fold return. That would be like our minimum goal. 
and then a, a 60-fold return would be like, a, oh yeah, but a 100-fold return? How many, who's done the math yet on a 100-fold return? How much is a 100-fold return? $10,000. Can you imagine if we blessed the district with $10,000 from this $100 bill? And listen, you say, well, how are we going to invest that? I'm not, I don't want to do it this way. I don't want to say, just give me your money. No, I want to invest this somehow and then bring it back, okay? So I want to give you insight and get your faith, challenge your faith with me and, and believe with me that we can see this $100 grow into $10,000 at the end of the year. Amen? Amen? Are you guys challenged? Do you think it can be done? Of course it can. That's because we serve an awesome God. Would you stand with me as we read from the Word of the Lord this morning? This morning's sermon is called The Least of These. We're reading out of Matthew chapter 25, looking at verses 31 through 46. If you have your Bibles, you may want to turn there. If not, you can possibly look at the screen. Matthew 25, out of the New King James, it says, When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then He will sit on the throne of His glory. All the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And He will set the sheep on His right hand, but the goats on the left. Then the King will say to those on His right hand, Come, you blessed of My Father, Inherit the kingdom that was prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, and feed you, or thirsty, and give you drink? Or when did you see a stranger, or you a stranger, and take you in, or naked, and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison or, and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say unto you, Inasmuch as you did it one to the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Then he will also say to those on his left hand, Depart from me, you cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Assuredly, I say to you, and as much as you did it to the one of the least of these, you did not, uh, did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Let's pray. Lord, um, we submit ourselves to you this morning. We give you permission to work in our lives, to have your way in this place. Holy Spirit, we invite you to be our honored guest. Would you move in our hearts? Continue to mold us and shape us into the image of Jesus Christ. Bring us from glory to glory. And today, as we look at feeding the homeless, as we actually go out and physically do this, I pray for your blessings to abound, for wisdom to abound, for your protection to be around us, for the right words to say. I pray that hearts will be open to receive the gospel of Jesus Christ as we feed them. We love you and praise you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and smile at somebody as you have a seat this morning. I want to share with you a story that was shared this past week at retreat. There was a man and his wife, they had gone out shopping. And all the ladies are like, oh yeah, shopping. <laughs> so they went to the local mall, and as they were walking around, they were walking past a pet store. And lo and behold, outside of that pet store was a parrot. And that parrot said, hey mister, you know what? And as the man was walking by, he said, what? And that parrot said, you're ugly. <laughs> <laughs> and your wife is ugly too. Oh, that did not go over very well with this guy. So he went inside the store to complain to the manager. He's like, I can't believe what your parent just said. He just told me that I was ugly and my wife was ugly. So the guy said, don't worry, I'll take care of this. And he went in the back and he grabbed a pair of rubber gloves out of the freezer. Went out there, grabbed hold of that parrot and just started smacking that parrot around. I mean, he, he smacked it so hard the head almost spun completely off of this thing. And he put that parrot back out there on a the perch and he told that guy, he said, you won't have to worry about that parrot saying that again. 
So the guy and his wife had finished their shopping, and he knew he had to walk past this store again. And he didn't want to look at that parrot. He just thought, I'm not going to look, I'm not going to. And as he was walking by, that parrot said, hey, mister. And the guy said, what? And the parrot said, you know what? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing had changed. May we not be like that parrot. But we get scolded for something and we just don't want to say it, but yet on the inside we're still, you know what. <laughs> you know, we're guilty of this when we make excuses as to why we shouldn't minister to people. But Lord, you know what. This afternoon we have an opportunity to be a blessing to the poor and the needy and those in need at 2.30. I want to encourage you to make time for that. Or if you've given, that's fine, that's great too, that's awesome. But before we go to that place, let's dig into this passage this morning and look at what we should understand. <laughs> it's funny, when I, 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 when I was praying over this message, and I have to tell them myself, when I was praying on this message, I, I like to do points, as you can tell, three points normally, and three points came, but I was like, God, that's, I was like, that's so simple. Did I come up with this? He's like, no. I said, but those three points are so simple. He said, yeah. I said, are you sure? He said, do this. I was like, how can I make a sermon out of these three simple points? He said, it'll be done. I was like, all right. So here we go. Your first point. Jesus is coming. I was like, yeah. I was like, yeah. And, And I'll be honest with you, that's one of my favorite subjects right there. I was like, yeah. I was like, Lord, they know that. He said, yeah, but let's, go, let's do this. I was like, all right. Oh, what's the second one? He said, the blessed. I was like, okay. And he said, the th- oh, so what's the third one? He's like, the cursed. I said, that's simple. He goes, yeah. So let's get into this. Jesus is coming. In our passage this morning, it talked about the, when Jesus comes. And I'll get into that one in just a minute. When he comes, he's going to separate the goats from the sheep. I did some research on this. I want to know, okay, how do they separate the goats from the sheep? Because I know that shepherds, sheep follow the, ma- the voice of their master. I didn't know if goats did that or not. Goats are ornery little things. There was one, our neighbor, Aldi Brault, had one. That was an ornery, or- ornery little goat. Of course, we were probably ornery at it too. But, but sheep, when you get them together, you can have three, four different flocks together at a well or at a feeding place. And the master, the shepherd, can start walking away and he'll do his call or his whistle. And what's so fascinating, even though all those sheep have been mingled in together, as soon as he whistles or calls his sheep, they know his voice and they begin to follow him. And as those shepherds start going four different directions, those, that flock, that big, huge, mixed up flock, separates out into four different places. It's awesome. But when the shepherd has sheep and goats together... He leads the flock of of the sheep and goats. If you notice, I want you to notice something. They're together. And then he turns around, faces the sheep and goats. And as they walk towards him, he takes his staff and he gently presses on the sheep of the right-hand side of their face, which uh, means that they go to his right, on the left-hand side of the face of the goats, which means they go to his left. And that's what he does. He'll stand there and separate the sheep from from from, from the goats. It's interesting to see how that happens. That no matter where they're at, that, that shepherd can separate them just by gently tapping them on the side of the face. Now may we be people, men and women, who the Lord gently taps on the right side of our face when that time comes. Jesus is coming. This is not an if statement. This is a, and I want to clarify this for my friend Wynn, this is a when statement. Okay, this is not an if statement, this is a when statement. Matthew 25, 31, when the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then He will sit on the throne of His glory. I want, I want you to visualize this first, okay? When the Son of Man comes in His glory. Now, when, when the disciples walked with Jesus on the earth, He wasn't in His full glory per se. They could look at Him. There was one time that we know of in the Word that's recorded in the Word where Peter, James, and John went up on the mountaintop. 
And as Jesus was praying, next thing you know, he's standing there in his full glory, talking with Moses and Elijah. And as he's standing there talking about the things to come, that was his crucifixion, the disciples were like, whoa. Peter says, Lord, it is good for us to be here. Let us build you one, a, a shelter for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. <laughs> I love Peter. But he was in his glory. But for the most part, he walked among men. There was nothing uh, 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 gracious about him, nothing to really appeal to men. To make, not like Absalom. You know, Absalom had the long, awesome hair and all this other stuff. But Jesus was just Jesus when he came. But there is a time coming, and Matthew right there we just read, when he comes in all of his glory. So you can imagine this is going to be a spectacular event. When he comes in all of his glory. And with, I love this next part, and with all the holy angels with him, not just one, not just three, not just two at the tomb. We saw what, what two at the tomb could do, or one at the tomb. The soldiers fell down and, and they were frightened. No, no, he's coming with all his angels. Every last one of them. All of the holy angels. And when he comes, and all of his glory, and all of his holy angels. And we know that Jesus has got a lot of holy angels. And as they come, they, 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 all nations will be gathered before him. So we see that Jesus is coming in his glory with all of his holy angels. This is going to be a fantastic, a spectacular event. One that hasn't been seen before and won't be, I don't think it'll be seen again. This is going to be just a culmination, an awesome time when the Lord comes. But how do we know that Jesus is returning to this earth? Well, we've got a sure foundation, and that is the Word of God. Three reasons we can know that Jesus will return. And I like this, out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let a thing be established. By the way, the list of three is just three of 3,000 concerning his second return, the return of Christ. When Jesus was taken up into heaven from earth after the resurrection in Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. Now Jesus had gone up in the clouds, the disciples are standing there. Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. This same Jesus. In other words, it's not a different Jesus. It's nobody else but Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords. And he's coming back in a cloud to come back to this earth. Paul wrote the believers in Thessalonica, in 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 through 18. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep or those who have died. For the Lord himself will ascend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. That's good news right there. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. I love that last part. It's good to talk about the return of the Lord. It's good to talk about the fact that those who have died before us, those that served the Lord and have gone on to heaven before us, won't be dead forever. They're going to rise up out of the graves to meet the Lord in the air, and then we're going to catch up right behind them. Amen? That's exciting news right there. woo Yeah, it makes me want to do a little bit of rapture practice. So we see this. Zechariah is a third example. He saw Jesus come back in a vision. Visions are fascinating if you read through them in the Bible. You find it in a vision, men don't, normally don't know whether they're actually, they think they're actually right there. I mean, the vision's like, if we were having a vision right now, that's, this is what it would be like. You actually feel like you're there. So Zechariah has this vision. So he sees exactly what is about to take place. And Zechariah, verse 14, or chapter 14, verse 4. <laughs> and in that day, what day is that? The day when he returns. His feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west. 
making a very large valley. Half of the mountain shall move towards the north, and half of it towards the south. Well, why did he say the one that faces towards, towards Jerusalem? Well, I'd imagine somebody somewhere would probably say, well, that's not the Mount of Olives he's talking about. He's probably talking about the Mount of Olives in, in heaven. No, he's talking about the Mount of Olives on earth, right outside of Jerusalem. And Jesus is coming back, and he's about to make a big cavern right there. Why? Well, in the 1500s, the Turks decided, realized that the Messiah was coming back to Jerusalem. They knew that he was a prophet. They also know that the prophet's not supposed to touch any dead thing. So they thought, well, we'll fix this problem. We don't want him coming through the eastern gate. We'll seal it up with concrete. And just to make sure it doesn't happen, we'll plant graves right, out front, right in front of it. Well, little did they know. And apparently they didn't read Zechariah 14.4. Because when Jesus sets his feet down on the Mount of Olives, he splits that joker wide open. And he swallows up the graves that are set there right in front of it. Opens up the door so that he can walk through without any problems at all. Not that it would be a problem for Christ to touch any dead thing. Because we read in the word where he walked up to a coffin. Where there was a man who was dead as a boy. And the, the mama was wailing behind the funeral procession. And he just touches the coffin and says, son, get up. That's the JMB version right there. And the boy arises from the dead. And he's restored to his mother. So we see that Christ, when he comes back, is going to put his feet on that Mount of Olives, split it wide open, and walk through that eastern gate in Jerusalem. Hallelujah. Well, that's good news. So knowing that Christ is returning soon. And by the way, before we even get to that part, the apostles thought that he was coming back in their lifetime too. They thought, you know, we just read it in Titus, or wherever it was we just read I'll go back to my notes so I can look at it right there. Thessalonians, it's in the Bible. That's right, it's in that book, in the Bible, where, where Paul tells him, he says, and we which are alive. He was thinking, hey, Jesus is coming back real soon. Well, it's been about a little over 2,000 years, and he's coming back real soon. That's my, that's, and that's my story, I'm sticking to it, because that's what the Word says. But we see, his, if knowing that he's coming back soon, how should we live? Titus gives some insight into that. <coughs> Chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed <coughs> and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. I want you to notice what Titus is saying in the scripture. There is a lifestyle of holiness that God is calling his people to. Now this doesn't mean we're perfect, but we strive to live a life that is pleasing to him. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> we no longer live in habitual sin. That is, we no longer sin the same sin over and over again every day. You see, there's a difference between falling into sin and deliberately diving into sin. Okay? If you fall into sin, you get up, you keep walking. It happens. Okay? Because we're human. And I don't, that's not an excuse to do that. But if you're getting up and just diving right into it, woo, this is where I'm going today, you got a problem, an issue, a big issue that needs to be dealt with. It is Christ who has given us the free gift of salvation. It is not of works. Because no matter how good you think you are, you still fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23 tells us, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Now again, this is not a license to sin, though. Because just as we read in Timothy, we are called to live or, uh, as ones who deny ungodliness. <coughs> we deny worldly lusts, and we are to live soberly, righteously, and godly. One well, interesting thing. Disney characters. Have you, anybody here ever been to Disney World or Disneyland? How many have been to Disneyland out in California? A couple? All right. That's a fun place, too. Though you can put Disneyland inside the parking lot of Disney World. Just saying. I love going to Disney World. It's one of my favorite places on earth to go. I get excited when, you know, Mickey comes out. He's one of my favorite characters. Now, I don't go screaming like a little girl when he shows up, but I do think it's really cool. That's fun stuff. Uh, I enjoy all the different things that happen there at the, the, the parks. One of the things I learned about Disney World is that when the people, the employees, and they call them uh, something else, cast members, when they get into their costumes to come out, 
as soon as they are in costume, they are not to break character. It doesn't matter if they are in their dressing room. As soon as they are in their costume, they are in character. When they walk down the, the tunnels underneath the Disney World and they're, they're being greeted by other employees, they stay in character. So if you are Princess Bella or whatever her name is, Bella, you stay as Bella. Or if you're Gaston, you stay as Gaston. Or if you're Mickey Mouse, hot dog. I mean, you're, just, you're Mickey Mouse the whole time. So long as you are in that costume, that is who you are. You have put on that character. You see where I'm going with this right now? When we put on the character of Christ, um, Christians should be in godly character as soon as the garments of salvation go on. We should not break the character of Christ as we wear His righteousness. We should not break the character of Christ as we wear His righteousness. We put on a garment of salvation and robes of righteousness, and we shouldn't break character as we have those on. Why? Because we are now dead to sin and alive in Christ. And I hope that helps you as you go about your, daily, uh, your, your day, that when you, even when you wake up in the morning, you put that garment on, you're like, you know, you have that garment on, and you're like, you know what, today I'm, I'm living in the call that God has called me to. I am new in Christ Jesus. I am wearing His robes of righteousness I can do th- all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can live for Him. We're also to look for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Are you longing to see the return of Christ? You see, the first time He came, He came to die. The next time is to put all things underneath His feet. This includes the devil, Satan, Satan who has caused us so much trouble. Has Satan caused you any trouble in your life? Okay. (laughs) Can I get a witness? (laughs) All right. Revelation 20. I love this next passage. Revelation 20, verses 1 through 3. (laughs) Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven. Coming down from where? That's right. Having the key to the bottomless pit. Now, where do you think that's located? Hell. Okay. In the center of the earth, in hell. And a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who was the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. I love that verse. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. I have a statement for you, and I'm sure you've heard it before, but I'm going to say it again. The next time Satan reminds you of your past... Remind him of his future. You see, he knows his time is short. His destiny is to be bound a thousand years inside hell. I love that part. He's loosed for a season. And then he is cast into the lake of fire forever and ever and ever. Amen. Knowing this, then, we should be on our guard physically, mentally, and spiritually at all times. You see, Satan is like a roaring lion walking around seeking whom he may devour. Keep the door shut so that he can't devour you. Keep on the armor of God. Stay inside of the character of Christ. Don't come out, because then he'll eat you. We should be straining our necks looking for the Savior to appear. The Lord Jesus is coming back, and He's coming back for a spotless bride, one without spot or wrinkle. Garments that are spotted and wrinkled are ones that have been in sin. So how do we get them clean? Let's say, yeah, if you think, you, you examine yourself, you're like, my garments are dirty, I've been living in sin. Well, there's a free washing available to you through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And it's a simple thing you do is repent. Pray this something like this. Father, please forgive me. I repent and plead the blood of Jesus over my soul. Please cleanse me from all sin. Make my garments white before you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And then keep your garments clean. If you fall down into sin, get back up. Don't stay there and wallow around. Don't dive into sin. Get up. Repent. Wash them in the blood of Jesus. Keep them clean and wrinkle-free. 
If, you're, if your private life is full of sin, then I would encourage you to re- take time today and repent. Wash your garments in the blood of the Lamb. Don't miss eternal life because of sinful pleasures here and now. All right, let's move on to the blessing or the bless in our passage this morning. So point one was Jesus is coming. Number two, the blessed. Matthew 25, 34 through 40, we just read it this morning. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say unto you, Inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it unto me. Here we have the sheep on the right hand of the Savior. He's touched the staff to the right of their heads, and they have moved at his bidding. And Jesus tells them the list of things that they did to bless him. I want you to note they had no clue that when they did these things, they were ministering to Jesus Christ. They didn't know they were doing this to Jesus. They just did it. It was part of their character. They had on the character of Christ and they ministered to the least of these, their brethren. They showed no favoritism to believers as by ministering to the least of them. And as they ministered to the poor and needy in Christ, they were in essence ministering to Christ. If you notice, least of these, my brethren. Now, does that mean that we should only help those who call on the name of Christ? No, that's not what that means. Besides, do we know the heart of every man? No, we don't. Ministering to the poor and needy is a great way to share the gospel. Listen, if you can't get a word in edgewise to a non-believer, stuff his mouth with a burger. <laughs> I have seen it work. When I was in Bible school, when the, we would go down to what was called the slab at Fort Worth. We'd go down there at dark time. It was a scary place to go. But it was fun, too, at the same time. I knew where I was, was supposed to be. And there was this crazy, crazy Cajun, Terry Durio. And he would stop by Mickey D's and pick up just bags of the, the cheeseburgers. 99 cent cheeseburgers. No, there were 69 cent cheeseburgers at the time. So he'd get two or three bags of these things and go down to the slab. It's amazing how many words you can get in when the other person's sitting there going, nom, 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 nom. They will listen to you when their mouth is being fed. So if you can't get a word in mouth-wise or edge-wise, feed them a cheeseburger. It opened up the door many times to preach the gospel. You didn't hear, yeah, but. (laughs) The only thing you heard were the chops slapping together. It was awesome. The blessed in our passage this morning had this in common. They put on the Lord Jesus Christ. They had him on. They were in character, if you will. They ministered to those in need. I'm going to tell you this. Ministering to people will cost you. It costs them. Ministering to those people costs them. It costs them food and drink to give away. It costs them effort and space to take in a stranger. Uh, something I know that's uh, culturally speaking, that was something normal for uh, kind of on the normal side of things for them to do. Nowadays, it's uh, we live in a different culture, but there are ways that we can still take people in. You with me? They took them in. It took them effort. Took a space. It cost them clothing to cover the naked. It cost them time to visit the sick and those who are in prison. They did these things not for reward, but because they were true believers in Christ and followed His example. When, follow, uh, when we follow Christ and put Him on, we are to be in His character. See, Christianity is not something that we take on and off like a coat. It's a lifestyle of living Christ-like. When we put Him on, then we begin to act like Him. You see, Jesus fed people physically and spiritually. He fed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fishes. On the Sermon on the Mount, he fed the people spiritually. 
At 2.30 today, we have the opportunity to feed the hungry and feed them spiritually as well. So we've got that same opportunity. Jesus visited the physically sick and spiritually sick. Peter's mother-in-law lay in bed with sick with a fever and Jesus came in and he laid hands on her and rebuked that fever and it went away. The spiritually sick. I'm sure you all remember the story of a wee little man. A wee little man was he? His name was Zacchaeus. That's right. You see, Zacchaeus had a problem. He was spiritually sick. He needed a doctor. Dr. Jesus came to town. He said, Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house today to eat. And that just blew Zacchaeus away. A spiritually sick man, and you're coming to my house to eat? All right. Zacchaeus found salvation that day. He found health that day. Jesus visited those that were prisoners of Satan and set them free. Last week, we, I think it was, we talked about the demoniac. Or maybe it was a week before. Well, you can remember the story. The guy was full of demons, a legion of demons. Jesus set him free. And you know, people are more apt to listen to the gospel when you're demonstrating it. I love this quote. I heard this years ago. The power of the gospel is demonstration. The power of the gospel is demonstration. Why? When people see it lived, it makes a powerful impact. When they see it demonstrated, it makes a huge impact. It's like dynamite. By the way, just want to let you know again, good works are not the cause of salvation, rather an effect of salvation. Good works are not the cause of salvation. You don't earn your way into heaven. This is not Jehovah's Witness. Okay, you cannot earn your way into heaven. It is impossible. You can walk on broken glass, uphill both ways, through the burning hot desert sand, through the snow, and you can't make it into heaven. No matter what you do, you can give all your stuff away to the poor, and you can't make it into heaven. There is nothing that you can do to get into heaven. The only thing you can do is repent and put your faith and trust in Christ Jesus, who has paid the way so that you can get into heaven. That's how we get into heaven, is to repent and put our faith and trust in Christ alone. If we call ourselves followers of Christ and fail to put Him on the throne, then we become the next group of people. Our third point, the cursed. From our passage this morning. Verses 41 through 46. And he will also say to those on his left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. I want you, I want you to understand this. Hell wasn't designed for people. I want to say this again. Hell was not designed for people. Right there in the word it states that it was designed for the devil and his angels, those that rebelled. However... Because God is a just God, because He is perfect, and He is holy, and He cannot be persuade, or persuaded by men, because He is righteous, He has to punish sin. And that is where sin goes, or where people in sin go as well. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Assuredly, I say it to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. Here's the scary part. And these will go away into everlasting punishment. But the righteous knew eternal life. That's the good part. I want you to notice that the sheep and goats graze together until the Lord's return. The sheep and goats graze together until the Lord's return. Now, grazing with sheep doesn't make you a sheep. No more than walking into a garage makes you a car. 
You see, these goats, these goats thought they were all right, or I ate. They thought they were good. They ate the same grass as those sheep did. That's right. Nom, nom, nom. They were led by the same great shepherd right there in front of them. There's Jesus. They drank the same water as the, je- the sheep j- drank from. These goats are right there with those sheep. But they remain goats. And these would be those that go to church every Sunday. They may be in church every Sunday. They may even tithe. They may even go to a Bible study, but they refuse to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. They refuse to crucify the flesh. They refuse to be led by the Spirit. They want the benefit of eternal life without the sacrifice of following Christ. It costs them eternity. But the strange thing is, it surprised them. When did we see you hungry, thirsty, naked, sick, or in prison? And Jesus answered, Inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment. As Bruce comes this morning, I want to remind you of the very last part of 46. But the righteous unto eternal life. What is your attitude towards the least of these? Is it Christ-like? You find joy in helping those in need? Do you desire to pray for the sick, minister to the lost? Do you follow the leading of the Holy Spirit when you, even when your heart is pounding and, and fear is just knocking at the door? And that happens. You'll find that as believers, the one thing we'll fight is the spirit of fear. Jehovah's Witness don't fight the spirit of fear. Mormons don't fight with the spirit of fear. Satanists don't fight with the spirit of fear. When people proselytize their, their false faith, they don't fight the spirit of fear. Why? Because it's not going to dissuade them. It's not going to fight against itself. A kingdom divided against itself won't stand. So if your heart is pounding and you felt like the Lord was telling you minister to this person and you're like, I don't know if that was the Lord. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> knock, knock, knock. It probably was. Especially if you start fearing, feeling fear come upon you. You see, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, against, but against powers and principalities and rulers of darkness. And, this, and, this, and it just those are the things we wrestle against. It's not human beings. So when you hear that still, small voice, and he says, go minister to that person. Go see if there's anything they need prayer about. Buy them a cheeseburger and talk to them. And your heart starts racing. like, And you start thinking those thoughts, of maybe that wasn't the Lord. Maybe that was just me. It wasn't you. It was the Lord. It's the Holy Spirit. That's part of being led by the Spirit. Or have you been playing the part of the goat? Happy to eat the grass, drink the water with the sheep, never committing to the work of the ministry. And now when I say that, I don't mean, is Pastor Jason saying that we should all become pastors? <laughs> no, no, I'm not. <laughs> nope. You do what God has called you to do. Wherever that is, wherever that job may be, you do what He has called you to do. You see, you reach people that I won't come in contact with. I reach people that you won't come in contact with. Did you know God's pretty smart and He has a plan? He's pretty strategic too. He puts us in places to minister to others. Isn't that a shocker? No, it's not a shocker. God puts us in places so that we, we can minister to those around us. He has you at a place for a season, for a reason. If Jesus, the great shepherd, were standing in front of you, would he touch the right side of your face or would he touch the left? And if you're not sure, I want you to examine your heart today. Take a moment this morning to pray, ask the Lord to forgive you, and put on Christ and live for him. Would you stand with me this morning? We're going to open the altars. If you found, you think, well, man, you know what? The Lord may, he may hit me on that left side. 
if that thought is yours, would you come this morning and make things right with him? You just may want to come and praise the Lord this morning. That's fine too. You're like, yeah, I'm good. Had this conversation with the Lord. I know I'm his. He's been touching the right side of my face for a while. That's awesome. But would you come and make things right if you need to this today or this morning as Bruce leads us in a song? Would you pray with me this morning? Lord, you are all that we want. We choose this day to put you on and to keep you on. We choose to walk in your righteousness and your holiness. We choose to minister to the least of these. And Lord, I ask for your blessings today as we go out, as, a, as people from this congregation go out to minister to those that are hurting those that are lost. Lord, even those that may even make fun of you. We pray for their salvation today. We pray that today would be this day of salvation for them. Today would be the day that they choose you. I pray for these at the altar this morning. I thank you for their willingness to come before you, to, to spend time with you. For those that know they're yours, I just thank you that you're pressing upon the right side of our face. And for those that weren't sure, I thank you that you've given them that assurance this morning. That they know that it'll be part of the sheepfold. No longer a goat, no longer stubborn, but instead willing to follow you just like a, a sheep does his shepherd. Jesus, you are our great shepherd. We love you and praise you. Please guide and direct us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, thank you so much for coming out this morning. Those of you that are going to be helping out with the homeless, I'll see you down at the shelter at 2.30. The rest of you, have a wonderful day. We'll see you Wednesday evening. You are dismissed.